Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our final panel of the 2021 American Dream Reconsidered Conference, Living History, Documenting 2020 to 2021, which is sponsored by Roosevelt University Center for New Deal Studies. And once again, I would like to thank our title sponsor, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, for their support of this exciting conference. Today, we are very much looking forward to hearing from a panel of distinguished guests, which include Roosevelt alumna and current Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden, speak about how librarians, archivists, and other professionals work to document history while it is happening. We all recognize that the last couple of years have been momentous, from the COVID-19 pandemic to the racial justice movement, and our panel is here to discuss how we collect and preserve this history in real time. This year's American Dream Reconsidered Conference focused on the theme of hope and opportunity. As we conclude the 2021 conference, let us reflect on our opportunity and obligation to land on the right side of history as we confront the challenges facing us today. I now invite Margaret Rung, Professor of History and Director of the Center for New Deal Studies to say a few more words about the session and introduce our moderator. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Provost Kruger. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the 28th Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Distinguished Program, which is sponsored by the Center for New Deal Studies at Roosevelt University. Founded in 1995, with a generous grant from Chicago and Gwen Hirsch, the center is dedicated to preserving the vision and the legacy of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt and their New Deal. This annual program is one small way that in which we do so. I'd like to offer a thanks uh, to graduate assistant Mary, Mary Grace Perez, to the marketing and technical team of Amanda De Palma, Mike Kaluzny, Deanna Lee, and Zachary Phelps, and to Kathy Bliss in the president's office for their help with the logistics of today's events. Over the years, this program has hosted many wonderful speakers, including the late journalist Koki Roberts, Surgeon General Regina Benjamin, Chicago icon and oral historian, the late Studs Terkel, international human rights lawyer, Patricia Vizier Sellers, and many others who have reflected on a variety of topics relevant to the values espoused by the Roosevelts. This year's program continues that tradition. Entitled Living History, Documenting 2021, our panel features these five distinguished guests who will consider how we collect and preserve the history that is happening today. This topic and the questions animating this panel seem especially pertinent to a program named after the Roosevelts. Franklin D. Roosevelt was the first president to create a presidential library and archive to hold the vast treasure trove of his papers. He embarked on this task in the late 1930s with the intention of donating his home and land to the federal government for the establishment of this library and archive. Ever aware that he worked for the American people, President Roosevelt understood that his presidential papers belonged to them. Today, of course, the Franklin D. Roosevelt Library in Hyde Park, New York is just one of many presidential libraries, but it stands as a testament to the importance of publicly accessible archives in a democratic society. I will now turn the screen over to today's moderator, James Grossman, who will introduce our panelists. Jim Grossman um, became the executive director of the American Historical Association in 2010. This is the premier professional organization for historians in the United States. As its head, he has raised the profile of the work that historians do as he emphasizes the need for historians to be at the table from the corporate boardroom to school board meetings. As he says, hashtag everything has a history. Dr. Grossman has also given generously of his time to Roosevelt University, serving on the Center for New Deal Studies Advisory Board for over 20 years. So it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome James Grossman, who will introduce our panelists. Thank you. 
Thank you, Margaret. And uh, that's very generous. I very much appreciate it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be very brief in my introduction of the panelists, actually. Uh, and a few very quick things. One is uh, these introductions are going to be very short. Uh, I'm not going to do justice to any of my colleagues on this panel, uh, because if I did justice to their careers, uh, we would be here forever introducing. Uh, second, I want to try to keep this conversation reasonably informal. So I'm going to apologize to the audience uh, for addressing my colleagues on the panel by their first names uh, in order to maintain that informality. And quite frankly, uh, these are all people whom I know. Uh, so I'm going to introduce in alphabetical order and we can have people speak that way as well. Lonnie G. Bunch III, is the 14th secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. Keep that 14th in your mind for a few minutes. Uh, he, over, he oversees 19 museums, 21 libraries, the National Zoo, numerous research centers, and several education units and centers. And he sleeps at night. He also has served as the founding director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and has been president of the Chicago Historical Society, uh, which is now the Chicago History Museum. In the interest of brevity, I'm going to skip his wide experience in museums from coast to coast, in addition to his teaching. In 2019, he was awarded the Freedom Medal, one of the four Freedom Awards from the Roosevelt Institute. He's won lots of other awards as well, and I'm not going to list them because otherwise uh, we probably wouldn't get to sleep tonight. Carla Hayden is the 14th Librarian of Congress, and this is the first time I've realized that both of you are number 14. Yes. Uh, I'm not quite sure what we do with that, but we'll let it go for now. Uh, she has also been the Chief Executive Officer of the Enoch Pratt Free Library in Baltimore, uh, one of the one of the most wonderful live names of libraries in the country, I have to say. And most important from my perspective, she has been the deputy commissioner and chief librarian of the Chicago Public Library, where she began her years, her career many years earlier than that as a children's librarian, returning as commissioner, as uh, as deputy commissioner and, and chief librarian after stints at the Museum of Science and Industry and the University of Pittsburgh. Carla has been president of the American Library Association and most important of all is a alumna, alumna of Roosevelt University. Patricia Sway is the program officer for public knowledge at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Her work there ranges widely developing initiatives supporting libraries, archives, museums, universities, presses, and other institutions that further our understanding of and appreciation for the humanities. She brought to the Mellon Foundation experience at the Library of Congress and libraries at Penn State University and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and has taught at Amherst College. Her other hat is as a scholar in Russian literature. Trudy Huskamp Peterson is an archival and certified archivist and has served as acting archivist of the United States. After 24 years with the National Archives in various roles, she became the founding director of the Open Society Archives in Budapest and then the director of Archives and Records Management for United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. In what I would quite frankly not call retirement, she has built an international reputation in the area of archives and human rights, including consultations in South Africa, Honduras, Sierra Leone, the Marshall Islands, Guatemala, and I think there are more, Trudy, is my sense. That's the only ones that we have written down here. But my understanding is that there are is that there are more than that. So this is who we're going to be listening to. 
And where we're going to start is on the theme of uh, collecting, preserving, and thinking about history. Uh, we're living in uh, an odd historical moment of multiple crises. Uh, actually, for hundreds of years, people have referred to their current environment as an odd historical environment. I think we can honestly say this is one. And the question is, how do we, as historians, librarians, archivists, think about the challenges and the imperatives of collecting, preserving, and thinking about history? Because those of us who write history know that what we write is completely dependent upon what is collected and preserved 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 500 years ago. So Lonnie, why don't we start with you? Uh, OK. Well, first of all, I'm very pleased. What would you say, Jim? To tell us what you think about the challenges and imperatives of collecting, preserving, and thinking about history. And then we'll just give each of you five minutes, and then we'll talk to each other. It seems to me that one of the most important things that a museum can do is to collect today for tomorrow. So many times during my career, there were stories I wanted to tell, issues I wanted to wrestle with, history I wanted to explore, um, and there were no collections to tell those stories. So it's crucially important that cultural institutions, especially museums, recognize that they have to have a contemporary residence. And in many ways, this moment we're in has really called for and challenged museums to be much more engaged and much more active. Uh, at the Smithsonian, um, both when I was a museum director and then as secretary of the Smithsonian, I created rapid response teams. The notion was that there were historical moments or moments that were going to be historically important and we needed to collect them, whether it was collecting Black Lives Matter or Eric Gardner or George Floyd. And that in essence, what we did is said, let us have our staffs out into the streets at the time these events are happening and collect in traditional and non-traditional ways. So for example, we collected um, the insurrection at the Capitol, uh, not only collecting the signs that people carried, but collecting the broken furniture, um, sh shards of glass from the insurrection. So in essence, the goal for me is to recognize that cultural institutions, especially museums, have a fundamental responsibility to assess through their scholarship, is this moment crucially important? And if so, how do we preserve it to make sure that we have the complexity of the moment? And so the key for me is that by doing that, you are both legitimizing the moment, letting the public know that this moment is important today. But then you're also ensuring that historians will have access to the materials and will be able to interpret the stories um, 10, 20, 30 years from now. Ultimately, the most important thing is to recognize that we believe that history matters. And if history matters, then you want to make sure that both scholars and the public have access to that history. Carl, you want to address the same question? Um, and Lonnie referenced uh, January 6th as, as part of that early comment about collecting. And you guys are right across the street. Uh, <laughs> yes, we are. And libraries uh, are partners and part of this uh, community of making information and materials available and accessible. And if it's not in, we like to say in the library world, if it's not accessible it's, or discoverable, then it really, it doesn't exist in one way. And so with the libraries and yes, January 6th, you are part of history, but you also are making sure that you have the oral history and, and collecting uh, tangible recollections of what's happening for that future that as Lonnie says, as my colleague, history never stops. <laughs> and you are making sure that when 
people are doing the research, you have the collections and in the Library of Congress's case, the descriptors, the metadata, how are people going to find the information? And so we're going through that reckoning uh, as the steward of the classification system for all types of libraries and including not only the Library of Congress's own classification system, but the Dewey Decimal System. How are people going to look and are we being uh, culturally sensitive and inclusive and making sure that the materials are there and we are getting the viewpoints ready for people who are using our materials now and in the future. So 50 years from now, what would a uh, Annette Gordon-Reed <laughs> and uh, John Neacham 50 years from now or Doris Kearns Goodwin, what primary source materials would they be delving into? And are we collecting them? Yeah. Patricia, you're, you help so many libraries think about this question. Um, yeah, um, so I, th I think I have some uh, threads to continue uh, from what Lonnie and Carla have said. Um, we, you know, th these times of protests and activism and crisis are really compelling for us because as museums and libraries and as archivists um, and curators in those places try to document what is happening, we um, at the foundation are also concerned, as I know my colleagues are on the panel, um, about persistence of the of the record. Um, and so, you know, for us, it comes for the funder, I suppose, it comes down to how can we help ensure that persistence and that longevity, um, particularly when so much is being collected that is based in social media um, and other types of media that um, we understand much better than we did, let's say, 20 years ago, but there's a lot more um, that we need to understand better. So one project that I'm, I'm guessing my um, esteemed colleagues know about is Documenting the Now, um, which grew out of the um, protest in Ferguson, Missouri, against the, um, the death of the murder of Michael Brown. Um, the fact that there were so many uh, protesters and activists um, using Twitter, for example, and hashtags uh, to track um, what was going on, to document what they were doing it was phenomenal. But do we have a way to capture that and to record it for posterity, not only so that that record exists to be made accessible, but to be studied and to be built upon um, and to understand what kinds of tools need to be made available um, as well. So, you know, one thing that I think about is I am a funder, but I used to be a librarian and once a librarian, always a librarian, I feel. Um, and so one thing that I, I also want to say is I am just um, thrilled to be on the same panel as Lonnie, Carla and Trudy because it's a, it's a librarian's dream to be surrounded by, um, you know, this um, the powerhouse of your minds. So but that's what I I we worry about or we, you know, what keeps us up at night is the format question and the media question and how do we help that persist over time? It's a historian's dream as well, Patricia, I can assure you. <laughs> Trudy, you bring an international perspective to this, uh, more international than I think anybody I know. Well, let me first uh, say how pleased I am to be a part of a Roosevelt University panel, because not only did Franklin Roosevelt create the first presidential library, but the National Archives Act is 1934. The National Archives is a New Deal institution. So we all are always grateful to Roosevelt and the uh, marker outside the U.S. National Archives on Pennsylvania Avenue to Roosevelt is one that he specifically wanted to be placed there. It's almost invisible. Uh, it's a little tiny one, but we're all very, very, very proud of it. When I think about archives uh, in the broadest sense, there's really two strains, of course. There's the archives of an institution that stay within the institution, and the archivists there are selecting within what is being created by the institution. If the institution doesn't go there, the archives can't. Uh, 
what the archivist can do is select from that body of created material what to retain or what not to retain. Whereas if you're working in a special collection or uh, a manuscript division, as the Library of Congress calls it, then you have a whole different focus. And it's much more like the museum uh, issue that Lonnie was talking about, where you have to decide what you want to go out and obtain uh, for uh, historical purposes. And yes, Jim, uh, I work uh, very much uh, outside the country. And uh, right now I'm in contact with people who are trying to move material out of Hong Kong. Another issue right now that is animating our world. I talk to people who are working in uh, places like um, Colombia, where there is an insurgent movement that does indeed threaten some of the material that's there. Uh, when we come back home, we look at the issues that are arising now on treatment of Native American children in boarding schools. And you start to see the big churches turn to their archives and see what was retained, what's there. So it's a really important job in the institutional archives to think about what human beings are going to need in the future to protect themselves and their rights, as well as to protect uh, a long-term view of history. So, um Patricia, I'm curious, uh, Trudy, Lonnie, and Carla all uh, are doing this from the perspective of large institutions with a very large scope and, quite frankly, a large budget. Uh, the Mellon Found you, you at the Mellon Foundation have a wonderful initiative where you're supporting the work of small institutions mm -hmm. uh, in doing this kind of thing. How, and I, I know this is not fair to ask you to answer on behalf of other people, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, how do you think some of the people who work at some of these smaller archival institutions uh, would answer that question? Do you think that they would answer the same way? Or do you think people at smaller, more focused institutions would answer that question differently? It's okay for you to say just the same and then we'll go on. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know that they would answer it the same way. I mean, I think their concerns are a little different because if um, so, one example is community-based archives, um, which for which we have been doing an open call for proposals the last three years. And if you are familiar with the Mellon Foundation, um, most of our proposals are invited proposals. Although increasingly we are doing open calls um, and learning certainly from our uh, federal funder colleagues like the NEH and um, NEA and IMLS on, you know, how to facilitate those calls. So, but these are small archives that have developed because um, no one is documenting their histories um, or the large institutions, you know, are not documenting their histories um, by and large. Um, so uh, it's occurred to us that um, there's there are stories that are not getting told that are missing, and and I would think that these archives, um, you know, in telling in the telling of those stories, would want there to be culturally appropriate description, culturally appropriate narrative, a fuller narrative, an understanding of, you know, for example, if it's um, an indigenous community, then an understanding of indigenous systems of knowledge and how relational um, tribal communities are. So I. I think it, yeah, they would answer it differently because they are marginalized and they have different perspectives as a result, very likely different values um, and expectations in the documentation of their histories. And uh, Jim, if I may uh, add to that, uh, the Mellon Foundation and Trisha <laughs> has been very instrumental in this is enabling the larger institutions like the Library of Congress with mm -hmm. grants, uh, one that um, we just received uh, widening the path of the people mm -hmm. to connect to the smaller and local efforts, digital collecting, uh, oral histories, going into communities with paid internships, all of these types of efforts so that there's even a greater connection and support for local efforts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And I, and I would and I would suggest, Jim, that um, 
you undervalued or underestimated the amount of regional and small collaborations. Right. All these institutions do that. The Smithsonian has over 200 affiliate museums, many are small, who you work with to do the oral histories, to collect the stories. Because the most important thing you've learned in a large institution is that some of the best innovation comes from smaller places. So we've all worked collaboratively with that. So in essence, there's no longer just the big institutions and what's happened with the little institutions. What we've really created is a real effective partnership and collaboration, thanks in part to organizations like the Mellon um, Family Providing Support. But ultimately, our commitment is to be national really means working locally. Mm. Well, I may also add uh, that um, internationally, there's a group called Sites of Conscience. And I know Lonnie's on the advisory board for that. And it tries to link around the world uh, small institutions, uh, archives principally, but not only, which have very important human rights records and tries to give them a network to begin to have some support out there. Uh, it's not perfect, doesn't give them a lot of money, but it's another way where uh, around the world, we're trying to support uh, a local-based institution. Well, that support's important. I, I remember, Lonnie, when, um, when you were first working on the establishment of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, there was concern that having, in, in essence, uh, the big kid on the block uh, would be a problem in terms of smaller museums around the country. And what you did was establish the principle that the National Museum would be not a competitor, but a resource. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's exactly right. Trudy, would the many institutions that you've worked with in other countries, would they answer that question differently because of the different kinds of imperatives uh, especially in places where there are such human rights issues, since that's tended to be where you've worked. I'm not sure they would answer it differently, but absolutely the political problems are vastly different. Uh, the ability to coordinate uh, from the center out is really, really hard. Um, you look at a place like Burundi, and you can hardly imagine how you're going to get the land records protected around the country, even if the center wishes to do that. So it's a very different problem to try to get those outlying things. One thing that we attempted in Colombia, to use that example, is a German grant came in and said, could the National Center for uh, historical memory, go out to one of the provinces and digitize for the local NGOs what they had. So there was a security copy in the center and there would be a copy for them to use in case their building got burned down or trash or whatever. And so we did a pilot. It worked okay. But again, that takes a lot of money and a lot of coordination uh, from all kinds of people. And it requires the communities to trust the center. And it's one thing to trust a center in a first world country. It's really different to try to trust the center in a country that's been riven by strife. And one of the, uh, just to add to that, um, in terms of the Library of Congress, for instance, it has six overseas offices uh, that are specifically tasked with retrieving material, making these things available to 45 other libraries throughout the United States. And often what the Library of Congress has, has been repatriated back to different areas because mm. they've lost it or things like that. So that international effort and coordination mm -hmm. is very important for the National Library. And the privacy issue is huge. Again, you have these projects which say, you know, we'll come in and copy things for you, but then we want to make them available in our institution. And when you have an enormous privacy problem, whether it's in police records or I worked in the Marshall Islands on the nuclear claims loaded with medical records, you just can't do that. You, you have to protect that privacy. And it becomes a limiting factor sometimes in both getting funds and finding safe havens.
So I'm going to switch gears a little bit uh, and talk maybe see if we can talk a little bit about what history is. Because when we think about, uh, someone mentioned earlier, uh, I think it was Carla, preserving uh, for the historians of the future, uh, that we are, uh, we are preserving what uh, historians will be using 50 years from now. We can't predict what they'll be using 50 years from now unless we think about what history is. And I'm very curious, when we're making these decisions about what to preserve, uh, how do we think about the difference between memory, history, the past, and heritage? Each of those things are very different. Uh, how do we think about, I mean, what, what we remember is not the same as what, quote, happened in the past. Mm -hmm. And that is not the same as what we write 50 years, 100 years hence, that we call history, which is an attempt to explain it all. So how do you see these four things interacting when we think about collecting memory, history, the past, and heritage? Are they in conflict sometimes? Lonnie, you know we don't oh. hear you. <laughs> okay, well, in that case, I was trying to. Anybody can no, jump in. You I've can disagree with each other. i talked about this before, so well, I... I I think you should, you should I, all I think for this. me, what's important is that, first of all, scholarship is the engine of all we do. It shapes sort of the decisions that we make about what we collect, but it also helps us think about what are the things that are going to be really important in the future. Now, that doesn't mean we always get it right, but it's really important to think through from a historian's lens. But for me, what is really crucial is that memory and heritage are all part of what we should be collecting. I think I became a much better historian when I began to grapple with and learn from the living community. Even <laughs> though my initial training was you need to be, you know, abstract and distance and, um, but really the key is that you can tell a more complete story if you have an understanding of the tension between history and memory. If you understand the story through the lens of personal heritage or community heritage, and in essence, what you really want is to be able to have material that provides an opportunity for scholars to grapple with all of these areas, because that makes the better history. That makes for a more complete and a more complicated story. Because what that really does by embracing history, memory, and heritage, what you're really doing is helping contemporary people and people in the future do something that I think is crucially important, and that is to use history to embrace ambiguity. Far too often, Americans, people around the world, look for simple answers to complex questions. And sometimes even historians, simply focusing on history or memory or heritage, gives a simple answer. What I think is that to, to help people grapple with that ambiguity really means exploring what are the tensions between history and memory and heritage um, and giving future scholars the reservoir that they can dip into in all those areas. So for me, while there's a distinction, they're all part of the way we collect and document because what we want to do is give the opportunity for nuance, complexity, and ambiguity, not simply a historical fact. Now you see why I wanted Lonnie to <laughs> take us there. <laughs> I, I wonder if I can ask a question. I, I, I think that is, I, I feel the same way, uh, Lonnie, about scholarship being the engine behind um, what we do, um, what museums and libraries and archives do. I, one thing that has been interesting in the work that we've been doing in the public knowledge program at the foundation and working with these smaller organizations um, is, and even with um, institutions like uh, uh, um, the uh, Morehouse and um, Spellman and AUC Woodruff Library, which is has a um, a project called Project Stand. It, it is a project that's based at um, University of Maryland now, but the University of Maryland and AUC Woodruff Library are collaborating on it. And what's 
unique about it is that this is a project, as you may have heard, in which archivists are working with um, student activists um, on ethically documenting their their activism. And so hmm. my question is, you know, where does co-creation fit in um, the way that we do record keeping and um, development of archives? Um, I love the, the fact that you bring in nuance because I think that co-creation can help ensure that there is nuance. Um, uh, and, you know, just curious about, you know, that whole co-creation, I guess, um, aspect given that small archives want their stories to be told and want their materials to be preserved. Um, but I think they also want to, to do this in collaboration with institutions, but as a co-creation kind of um, relationship. Oh, I think that's so important. The notion of recognizing that co-creation or kind of collaboration allows you to illuminate all the dark corners of mm -hmm. a story um, mm -hmm. right. and instead of missing some of those. And I think what is so powerful to me is the idea that um, co-creation also ensures that there are going to be multiple points of view. And it also ensures that um, there are going to be a variety of questions that may not have been asked um, by the individual. Mm -hmm. And I've been really struck by... Um, my old friend Dave Isay, who created StoryCorps, and the notion of what happens when you get people together looking at an event, looking at a story, the, the nuances that come out, the, the ways to think about things in different manner. So I would argue that the challenge with co-creation, of course, is to make sure that it is sort of an equal co-creation, that it's not sort of someone coming in and saying, um, your story is not as important because it's not in the form we're used to. Or, But I think the key is that what we've learned is we've learned that as a result of the pandemic, as a result of technology, we've learned to be much more nimble and maybe a little more flexible. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result of that, I think we're able to capture richer stories. I've always been struck by doing work in local communities and thinking, bringing the scholarship to the local community. And I remember, you know, meeting a man who had lived in a cabin with his enslaved grandmother. And he used to tell me after we went through all this talk about history and slavery, he said, well, you know, if you're here with me, it means that you realize that it's important how people remember not just what they want to remember, but what they need to remember. And that mm -hmm. co collaboration allows us to get what people want as well as what they need. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I think that in general, the first question that people will ask of, at least in archives, is who are we? And how does this record help me understand who I am? And if you look at the vast uh, majority of inquiries to the US National Archives, at least when I worked there, they were first genealogical, and then they were military service, uh, actually in reverse order. But it's it's me. It, it's who am I and how do I understand who I am in this world? And then we get to the second question, I think, which is how did we get where we are? And here's where history becomes our multiplier effect. When, when we get those threads and we bring them together and we can see how we get to where we are. But I think the question that we always have to keep in mind as, as archivists making selections or making collections is to make sure we understand that people are going to ask, who are we? Uh, I always quote the wonderful epigram of the um, El Salvador Truth Commission. And they simply said that their object was to say, all these things happened among us. And to me, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make sure that in the future, people understand all these things that happened among us. So let me throw a wrench into this a little bit. Um, because all these things that happened among us, uh, some of them are not terribly pleasant for some people. True. And that could be people who are powerful, and that could be people True. who are not powerful. So 
when Lonnie says, well, it starts with scholarship, it starts with what the scholars are going to need later, the history, there's an awful lot of things that are part of the past that are important to historians, but where important constituencies will say, that's not what I remember. That's not what I want to remember. That's mm -hmm. not what I want to be my heritage. Mm -hmm. That's not what I consider my heritage. This is offensive to me. Mm -hmm. Yes. How do we balance that? Dangerous archives. <laughs> yes. And, and reaching out and making those efforts to collect the the stories of people who haven't been included and respecting how they, for instance, I mentioned the uh, descriptions and the cataloging and we're going from being the owner and the authority on how we describe things to including the people that we're describing and asking them, how would you like to be? <laughs> mm -hmm referenced and what would be the descriptors and being more sensitive and respectful right away and acknowledging that um, what we are collecting it's not just for the scholars of tomorrow but the people of today and helping them with their own histories and how they see it and how they want it to be represented too. That sounds good. What happens, uh, I'm just going to pick an example out of the air. Um, one of the many terrorist acts or mass murders that we have in our world today and then in the past as well. And I'm, I'm an archive, I'm a museum, and uh, I want to collect materials that help us understand the perpetrators. Because yes. that's part of that history mm -hmm. that we've all mm -hmm. talked about. And the relatives of the victims say, no, <laughs> I don't want my community institution to collect things that help us to understand those awful people. I, I, I want this to be about the victims, the, my loved one. I mean, how do, you, how do you deal with that? Because there are different things that people want to remember uh, by collecting something. Some people would argue we're legitimating it. How do we think about this different angle of vision on historical events? Does understanding have to be uh, condoning? I hope not. The but... behavior or what you're looking at? And of the historians on the panel are be interested in that too, that asking you all. You must deal with this around the world in terms of some of the archives that you work with, um, that a lot of what they're collecting is horrible things. Yeah, it's true. Yes. And I certainly know institutions who have uh, had things donated to them and then have had major sponsors object and have returned those things. Uh -huh. So, I mean, that has happened. Not wonderful, and I'm sure no one wants it to happen, but it, it has happened. Um, and yes, uh, people are under threat. I, I spent three years working with the police archives in Guatemala. It is pretty much closed uh, because uh, the government really doesn't want the records used to prosecute people. Uh, so you get things that are literally closed down. You worry about their safety, but it, it does indeed happen. Um, there is a program called Safe Havens, and it is run out of Swiss Peace in uh, Switzerland. And they try to link uh, institutions that are really in trouble, where they've got material that is threatened, uh, with a place that will store it for them as a as dark storage, but as a, a safe haven. And so some of that happens when they've got real objection in the community to holding that kind of material. That's extreme. Jim, I understand you know, it. In, yeah. in many ways, Jim, I think that part of this is about how you help communities understand why you're exploring certain stories. And mm -hmm. that I've always found that 
people recognize that they don't want to be depicted as victims. But if you help them understand how exploring these stories talks also about their resiliency and about mm. their strength, um, people are more likely to be engaged. I've had, I, don't, I can't think of maybe 15 times throughout my career where people have said, why are you collecting a Ku Klux Klan? Exactly. We had that at the right. Building African American Museum. But my <laughs> argument is you can't understand resiliency without understanding pain. You can't understand the possibility of progress without understanding the other forces that countered that. And so the key is that I would argue that many of these are valid points of view, but they're not all equal. And so the key is for you to be able to frame them in a way that uses them to help people understand the process or how we got to this moment. But I found uh, many a time whether it was when we worked with Emma Till's family to tell that story. Mm -hmm. um, people said, as long as you're ensuring us that one, you're listening, but two, that you're telling a story that reduces this to human scale and helps us understand um, the pain and the resiliency and the strength of this. Um, I've rarely had people say, don't tell those stories, but you had to work at it. <laughs> and have the kind of conversations and recognize that that is part of the job. Uh, what this, one of the things that this gets us to is one of the unusual things about Roosevelt University itself. I know there's a lot of uh, current students and alums listening. And so as you all and much of the audience knows, Roosevelt is unusual in having social justice as part of its mission explicitly in its mission statement. And I know that your institutions uh, also have this in mind right now when you think about collecting uh, the imperative of social justice uh, as, um, as one of the reasons to collect and one of the logic, one of the logic, uh, one of the logics of collecting. Uh, but in this conversation, we very seldom hear a definition. So I'm very curious if we move from thinking about what history is to thinking about what social justice is. How do you, how do you and your staff try to define what social justice is when you use that as one of your markers for collecting? Well, I have to jump in as a Roosevelt alum and one thank <laughs> Roosevelt University for turning me into, I think the quote they had was a feisty fighter for freedom. <laughs> <laughs> Librarians don't always get that. We had t-shirts made. Uh, <laughs> and that, that, was our, that was our job to, to be uh, the original search engines and also to empower communities. And that was our job. And it was at Roosevelt with the combination of majoring in history and political science and then realizing that I could become a librarian and, and do the power to the people <laughs> with information that that was a pathway and so what we're doing now at the Library of Congress is making sure that our collecting policies are targeted to making sure that there is justice and discoverability and accessibility and also how we help other libraries and how they describe what they're doing and what they are presenting and that aspect of justice is something that is a core value in going through, but it's justice, not that you're going to uh, be the institution is here, we're going to right this wrong. You can do it, as the young people say, you can do it in your own lane and be part of a community seeking uh, social justice. Mm -hmm. I always define it, I think of a, when William McKinley was assassinated in 1901, there was a newspaper article and there was a line that said, how can this happen in a freer and fairer America? To me, that notion of social justice is simply that. How do we help make a freer and fairer America?
and that I would argue that, and I, and I, you know, I take heat for this, but I believe very strongly that we have a responsibility to use the tools we have to help transform a nation, to help make a nation better. And that for me, my tool is history and museums. So history without social justice, in my mind, is nostalgia. Mm -hmm. um, and nostalgia is fun for a while, but ultimately you've got to go deeper. And yeah. that what I really believe is that, as James Baldwin said, I love America more than any other country in the world. And exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. And I add, I insist on the right to demand a country to up to its stated ideals. All we're doing is asking America to be America. Right. I'll just jump in here and um, I'm grateful for the question. Um, I think the way that we look at it at the foundation um, is uh, the way that our president Elizabeth Alexander has put it, and that is in carrying out our mission of grant making at the foundation, if we want to do grant making through a social justice lens, then we should be asking whether this support, whether our support is contributing to a more fair and just society. Um, where have our resources gone in the past and where haven't they gone? Um, you know, where there is extraordinary work being done um, in terms of knowledge access and production, but that we have not yet um, been able to uh, reach out to and support. So I think translating this to collections and documentation, for example, um, which is what um, our program focuses a lot on, you know, we're keen to um, help communities whose stories haven't been told and shared and organizations, institutions um, that also have not been in our mix. We're keen to help lift up leaders um, in the field um, that are contributing to that fair and just society. Um, so I think that's where, that's what we are focusing on in terms of the social justice framework that's developed at the foundation. So let's, Trudy, did you want to go and then I'll, I'll, I have a follow up to this, but obviously- Yours is not America. Okay. Um, fair and just. There seems to be a consensus here. Um, on your staff and on your governing boards, does everybody have the same idea of what is fair and just? Our board has changed tremendously <laughs> in the last couple of years. Um, we have an incredible, you know, it's, it's in some ways um, a new board. I, I would say that they do because they're coming from different walks of life and, and, and backgrounds. Um, in terms of our staff, um, you know, I think we've done a lot of work over the last couple of years in coming to this shared understanding of what a fair and just society looks like and trying to put it into practice um, as an organization uh, with each other, um, but also through uh, the work that we do with our grantees. I don't know if that helps. Well, it's it's I yeah it does, but I'm I'm sure it's Lonnie and and Carla as well. Um, there are many ways to describe what's fair and just, uh, and if that's your goal, do your staff all agree on what's fair and just? And you encourage disagreement on it. We encourage uh, rigorous debate on certain aspects of uh, one of our <clears throat> biggest challenges is the balance with scholarship and the general public who are we collecting for and if we don't make it accessible mm. is it just a mausoleum <laughs> just mm. like you just have all of this uh, world's largest library all of this stuff but if nobody's using it and you're not adding it to it so we just announced and are working with uh, assessing all of the collections as 22 million items, the books and periodicals, what's missing. It's gonna be a multi-year effort, but it's every department, art, every department is now charged with this. There, there have been more discussions and we're making it very clear that people can, 
exercise their occupational uh, mobility <laughs> if this is not something that mm -hmm. they can participate in because mm -hmm. this is what the institution is going to continue to do. And I agree with Carla. I mean, I think that, look, you're never going to get everybody, but, you know, candidly, every institution I've ever worked with, people cared about making a country better. And we may disagree on how do you do that, but the notion is that with leadership, you define a vision of what's possible. You put in place programs like Car the one Carla just mentioned to begin to move an organization um, here at the Smithsonian, um, I created this notion of our shared future. How do we use our scientific knowledge, our, our historical content to help Americans grapple with the issues that divide them, issues of race or climate change or vaccination? Um, and so our goal is to have that common understanding so we can find a shared future. And I believe strongly that other leaders might have different points of view, but until they run me out, we're going to change the world. So, Trudy, surely when you're tromping around the world uh, on nearly every continent uh, in different kinds of places with different mm -hmm. kinds of political systems, do you run into this? Different definitions of what is fair and just? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. In various political systems. So I think at the bottom, you have human rights. And if you look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it is indeed universal. And you can get to a discussion based on that. Let me take uh, the question in a slightly different way, Jim, uh, because we haven't talked about business. And the big issue, one of the biggest issues in human rights now, is how do we get big corporations, big business, to respect the human rights of the people who are involved. And that, of course, also means making sure that the records of those institutions are available such that people can see what kind of decisions were made by the fossil fuel industry when they already knew that uh, climate change was going to be impacted. We've seen uh, the tobacco industry having to disclose. We've seen the pharmaceutical industry. Um, there is a UN document now on business and human rights that tries to put that human rights floor under it. But it's really tough, I think, uh, when we're dealing with archives of businesses to try to make sure that businesses are looking at preserving the records that would help lead to social justice. One of the big, big issues out there. So. That relates to a question that we have from the audience, uh, because the, the records that you're describing, many of them are digital. Uh, what goes on within a corporation on their Slack channel, um, a lot of it is stuff that probably we wish we didn't see if we did get to see it. Uh, and the flip side of that is that what our question from the audience is about how young people who have been involved in demonstrations document history through their cell phones. They communicate through their cell phones. Uh, Lord knows what kinds of financial records there are on Venmo already. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do we think about the world of record, the world of preservation, when we realize that these kinds of records may be essential to documenting what it, whether mm -hmm. it's corporate history, whether it's demonstrations, whether it's personal finance. How do we imagine doing this? I know Carl of the Library of Congress has been collecting Twitter, and I, don't, I can't even imagine well, what that's like. Well, and there's a special unit now, uh, the digital strategy unit. They have the collecting uh, aspect of how do you collect and maintain over time. Uh, things that are born digital. Uh, we have a group that they call themselves digital hoarders. <laughs> uh, they're scanning and, and collecting websites and going through and scoring out what kinds of websites. And then there's the challenge of the fiscal, the basic fiscal challenge of how do we support that access in the future and being able to keep up 
in the digital realm. Uh, digital storage, right now, that's what we're grappling with. Uh, we have 836 miles of shelving, physical shelving, but now we're really seeing, and we've got to maintain some of that because there still be, there will still be analog things coming in for the next 50 years. We know you know, materials, but they're, the digital is starting right now. Well, and we felt this was really crucially important when we collected Ferguson, when we collected, um, the insurrections in Baltimore, we collected it through youth help. We actually collected all the kind of cell phone photographs and videos that people took. We collected their memories that they shared as they were writing through a particular moment. So we've got units to recognize that our goal is to document a moment. And if that means you do the traditional stuff, great. But if it also means you have to think in non-traditional ways to collect that, then we'll do. These are the records of the future, but I would argue these are the records of today as well. For instance, we had the group, they, we have a Flickr account and mm -hmm. we gathered photos through that. Now I'm gonna stop personally right there because that's what the unit does with the Instagram, <laughs> but they're using all of that. And so that mm -hmm. unit is just, uh, really doing great work with keeping up with it and they understand it too but carla i know you're on snapchat you know i've watched you on instagram <laughs> i have a great team i have a great team and they're doing and that's but that's the thing to recognize it that and the, and sometimes that's a a tension uh with some of the longer term curators and and librarians that and department heads who well, and we're trying to bridge that gap internally. You know, it's interesting that you bring it up. I'm, I think tension is definitely um, there. And I, I also wonder if it's an opportunity. I mean, I, I think about this a lot, the fact that so much is being documented on cell phones and in social media and how are we um, helping to facilitate the collection of that material. Um, we, as I mentioned before, have that, this project called Project Stand, Student activism now documented. So that work is, you know, about working with students who are, you know, recording these activities and these protests via Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, um, and, you know, taking pictures on their cell phones. But I wonder if this is also an opportunity to think about um, in the, even the teaching of history and how to collect history, um, making uh, you know future historians aware of how they themselves could um, be preserving you know those cell phone photographs, um, and then also thinking about how archivists and um, preservation librarians or digital preservation librarians could be helping with that work as well, guiding um, the, the student historians or even uh, historians who, who are faculty um, to do this work. I think there's a really interesting opportunity there for all of us who are experts and specialists um, to consider new um, ways of, um, of cultivating that kind of um, capacity. That's where the internships and fellowships that we engaged in have been so important and we mm -hmm. learn a lot as well. Does this raise privacy issues in terms of what's collected so that yes. collecting these kinds of records, um, I know not every, I, I know there are people in this room who absolutely hate the idea of having to sit down at a restaurant and scan a QR code. <laughs> uh, but we do that now, or some of us do that now against our <laughs> against our will, maybe. But um, every time we scan one of those QR codes when we're ordering lunch, uh, or scan one of those QR, what, or when we do it when we check in at the airport, uh, we are creating a record. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. And should we be concerned about privacy issues in the existence of? of Yes. Archived records. Yeah. And we might not wish were collected. And who makes these decisions? Well, who makes the decision I mean, is really a good Carla, please. No, I, Trudy, you were you were 
well, it's a really complicated question that you're asking. You know, you don't know how much is being retained by the business itself or by the uh, vendor or by Facebook. So you don't know how much it is. My uh, belief is that people are comfortable if they release the information on themselves and they will release an incredible amount of what I would consider privacy information. But if you release it on them, you're in trouble unless you have their agreement. And so I think that over the long term, we're going to have to come to a societal agreement on what it is that we indeed continue to say can only be released by the person themselves while they're living. After they're dead, then we have this other conversation. Uh, usually we say there's no privacy right in the dead, but does that occur when we're talking about the Sandy Hook kids? Uh, you know, how far do we want to push this into the future? And then how does that affect the scholar's ability to understand what actually happened? So this is a big question you've asked, Jim, and I don't think there's an easy answer. Carla, you were going well, to... Well, there are some agreements, for instance, uh, with uh, people donating their papers and things about oh, sure. oh, uh, sure. how long, you know, before you let a researcher sure. in. Uh, and that, so those types of things were uh, somewhat standard in the analog world. In the digital, working with, you mentioned Twitter, or working with the company to extract the usable or accessible data and not the personal. And so it, it involves uh, being much more involved with what would be available for a researcher and what they'd be able to see. And, and so Carla, oh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also takes us right to the use of genealogical material to track down through DNA uh, alleged perpetrators. And that's a whole nother series of personally prepared materials that's sitting there. Uh, now we know that at many of these um, institutions that are providing that service do indeed get the permission and only if permission is granted is their DNA available. But this also becomes a big record keeping issue. Um, the Red Cross archives in Geneva holds the DNA records of uh, families of the missing in Chile uh, because they don't trust the government to hold it and they want some place if bones are ever found and the DNA is recovered, that it can be matched in a way that they believe is fair. Uh, so it, the privacy issue goes very quickly from our Twitter accounts to who else is holding this information about us and do we have any control over that? Mm -hmm. And cybersecurity starts to come in too that you oh, yeah. have to make sure that even the, the, what the, you do receive and what you make accessible is protected. And that becomes another fiscal yeah. issue as well. And just to, to side note, there are um, people and journalists, the one journalist, for instance, wants to give his uh, records just to make sure that they are safe, truly. <laughs> Sure. And, and documenting his things, and he wants to make sure that it gets somewhere for protection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, Trudy, you mentioned before corporate archives. Um, Verizon, United Airlines, I can use those two. It, 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 the corporate archive, the, the digital corporate archives of Verizon and United Airlines have just about every bit of information about me uh, <laughs> hopefully yeah. nobody will ever want to know. Yeah. Uh, but all of us have these, whether it's the cell phone carrier, whether it's the airlines, whether it's whatever, whoever we interact with, for many people, Venmo, uh, whoever we interact with or use as a medium of interacting with institutions and people has complete chronicles of our lives. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with privacy? Those are going to be collected. Those are collected. Those are preserved. What does an archivist do when presented 
with the objection of people saying, I don't really want those aspects of my life available to anybody, even in a hundred years. Well, I think you got to step back from that and say, in the long term, is your record and my record on United Airlines and everybody on the panel, is there going to be a research use for this? Is this important to document how flying impacted our lives? And so you step back and you say, in the long term, what's going to, you know, what is the real use that can be made for this? Um, I always say that, you know, at the end of the um, Nazi administration, there were all these records of how much uh, steel was going to be used for paper clips. Um, you know, okay, but the use of steel for paper clips is not something that most of us are going to care about in the long term. And so I think that some of that goes away if you step back and say, in the long term, you know, what are we going to need here to really be able to understand what happened in 2021? And I promise you, I don't think that my travel schedule on an airplane is part of that. So I'd make the appraisal decision to, to hold it as long as it was needed for business and then delete. But, you know, that's the, that's the argument that archivists have every day in business records, especially, and in government records. Mm -hmm. So let's move from one set of decisions that the archivists make, which is what to collect, to another set. Uh, someone in the audience has raised a question, really, that is, although not phrased this way, that's a, partly a cataloging question, uh, because that's another power that librarians and archivists have is they get to determine what the categories are by which we do research, uh, they're tagging. And so this question asks, who is defined as terrorist? The role of power in the categorizing and archiving, how is power thought of in archiving and framing of history? In the library world, uh, it, was, it was often said that catalogers are the most powerful people. <laughs> because they determine those subject headings and, right. and things like that. So how going from being the authority to that stewardship of terminology and being more conclusive, the library just established a task force on inclusive description for archival, unpublished and rare materials, reading it right from the thing. Um, and that aspect of getting more input from the people or the situations that are being described. One instance uh, recently, illegal aliens. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's some terms, the term itself might not go away because if you're looking at more historic materials, that term is still there. It might not it be is. the first one. It never goes away. It, it still exists, but you include, you're supplementing. And I remember uh, being part of that uh, with how you uh, describe Negroes, Black, Afro-American, all of that, and making sure that we had those types of descriptors. So being mm -hmm. responsible for the standards of that is, is really uh, the responsibility that we have. Naming. So our, oh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say that naming is power. To, mm -hmm. to be able to name is to have power. Um, and so uh, what you say, Carla, really resonates. Um, I remember being a child and being called Oriental. Um, and it was a term that my mother um, and father used. And then as I, you know, grew older, I became an adult, and I heard the term Asian American, which also has comes with it, you know, very complicated um, feelings and issues for many um, Asians who are American, Asian American. So, um, but I think there are some, you know, there are some developments happening um, as a result of various communities coming together and wanting to shift that dynamic of who gets to name. Um, an example is the traditional knowledge labels coming out of the local context um, group. Um, and those are to help uh, to recognize that in tribal communities and indigenous communities, they have, um, they have 
culturally appropriate ways of um, tagging and naming um, their materials and their cultural heritage? And why can't that be uh, recognized in a digital collection? Mm -hmm. So traditional knowledge labels have helped with that, um, as well as another um, system called Mercatu, which again was designed with input from tribal communities who want to be able to um, determine what gets shared um, and determine how it is described when it gets shared and who um, it is shared with. So there are some ways that um, the foundation has been helping in this space, but there's no question that there's a lot of work to do um, and a lot of, you know, the power needs to be um, needs to be shared and, and dispersed. But I, I want to defer to Lonnie and um, give you a chance to to say what you want to say. Well, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think the you know, some people have argued that technology is the great leveler and that mm -hmm. it's allowing people to be their own historians, mm -hmm. their own filmmakers. Um, I, I, I believe strongly that um, where we are is a place where we should be comfortable with shared authority. Um, the notion of the curator or the historian as, you know, dictator or as arbiter of all things is really something that needs to be sort of the rough edges need to be made smooth by collaboration. However, you, it does mean though that you've got to recognize that there are things such as expertise, training, scholarship, mm -hmm. and you really need to make sure that as you share authority, that you don't leave and right. run away from those things that are so crucial that give you the credibility. I think that my hope is that we continue to do several things. One is expand the canon of what is sort of important. Two, to expand who are the people that get to shape this. You know, Carl and I remember when we would go into rooms and we were the only black people. Um, so the key would be to sort of change that. Um, and one of the things I'm proudest of at the Smithsonian is the amazing array of diversity, ethnic, racial, uh, the programs that we do, intellectual diversity. So in essence, the key is to recognize that there are always going to be people that have power. But if you can diversify who that lot is, you get closer to the promised land of fairness and freedom. Because you Absolutely. do need to leave some structures in place as you're mm -hmm. transitioning and being more inclusive. And one of the first task force we have is a Native American task force. Mm -hmm. And we deal with, with that right now, encouraging community participation and engagement and mm -hmm. still providing that structure to help. But I think Carla said something really important is you don't wipe out the previous work because the previous work shows you where you came from. And uh, I can think of descriptors in the U.S. National Archives that are horrific by today's light, but you want to keep them because you want people to understand that in 1930, that was okay. And uh, we'll never know that if you whitewash how we got here. What do well, we I mean, do? You've talked about yeah. that with monuments. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, well. In yes. terms of monuments and not just taking them down. Right. Yeah. Carl and I have this conversation. I believe that yeah. the key to success is pruning monuments. <laughs> so you keep some, some show up like they do in Budapest at, at parks where they can be interpreted or museums. Um, but you, what you want people to realize is that monuments were never meant to be permanent, even though they're concrete and steel what they were are to be markers of a moment. So that means that we should have new markers for new moments. And so in order to do that, you got to prune um, and make room. I'd like to go back to naming. And then I, I, I wasn't going to open the can of worms of monuments, so I'm glad you did. <laughs> but the power to name that Patricia was talking about, what happens when you have spaces, objects, especially spaces in many ways that have been um, crossed by many different cultures, 
uh, you have objects that are used by many different cultures, you have process, all the examples that you've given. Uh, what happens when you have many different cultures who have different ways of naming, some of which could be mutually offensive, uh, mutually unacceptable? How do you make decisions? Who has who the the librarian and the archivist in the end is going to have to do it? Mm -hmm. How do you handle that problem of different the the shared authority? Who gets to share? Well, I would argue that you know you've got to have. That's why you have these institutions. You have these people that are working in those institutions. Um, ultimately, they get to make the call. What you hope is that they recognize that it's important that, you know, you just take the naming of a place. It'd be nice to know all the names of that place rather than um, the one name or the current name. And so I think there are, it really is about recognizing that we're talking about complexity rather than simplicity. And so that complexity means that there are going to be multiple ways to view something, multiple names. And then what you, then that complexity then means that based on scholarship, um, certain things become more equal than others. And those things will change over time as scholarship changes, as personnel changes. Um, and in essence, as you know, as well as I do, the only thing that stays the same is nothing. <laughs> And for librarians and catalogers, is to see also. Yep. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so there's one question from the audience about uh, picking up on our conversation about ephemera from the pandemic. Uh, who wants to know how are different pandemic experiences of different groups? being preserved? Oh, there's a lot of good work that's being done. Um, the Anacostia Museum documented what the pandemics did to Anacostia, um, that part of Southeast Washington. There are amazing programs that have documented um, the history of this recent pandemic on Native peoples. Um, so but in essence, there's a lot of work being done because we now recognize that when we studied the flu epidemic in 1918, we only looked at it through one lens. So now we recognize there are many different ways to explore these different pandemics and people are doing, I think, really good work at capturing that. And you collect that work. <laughs> and oh. you have to get your tentacles out there to say who's doing what and then that's how you collect. Which, which generates lots and lots of stuff, which is eventually findable through internet searches as the librarians and archivists exercise their power to name it. Uh, those of us with gray hair remember that we were taught in college how to find things. Well, it's no longer that hard to find things. So given that you're collecting these massive quantities, whether it's from protests, from pandemics, whatever, how do we help students sift through all this stuff in order to actually use this stuff as part of their learning process? It's no longer a matter of finding and they can find it, but how do they sift? But isn't, isn't Jim, isn't the issue really what are the institutions one trusts? What are the institutions that provide that credibility? So we've worked very hard at the Smithsonian to be that trusted source to say, you may find um, five different sources that explore January 6th. But if you explore through the Smithsonian or the Library of Congress, you right. can be sure there's, a, there's this element of accuracy. So I think that what part of it is, is to make sure people know where the trusted sources are, um, just like we learned in graduate school how to evaluate sources to write our history. Um, we need to help the next generation evaluate the sources that give them the information. It's the same structure that you had before in the digital realm. And so 
that's where authority comes in as well. And you're looking at what you, these sources are being vetted uh, yeah. by people who are weighing uh, which website, if it's the National Institute of Health or is it, you know, somebody mm -hmm. that has health issues, you know, mm -hmm. and which well, one do you go to? And so it's, it's using those same principle, that same st structure through the, you know, you're not throwing it out, but you're saying, and you call it information literacy. Basically. Jim, I, I want to uh, take on your premise, though. I don't think it's so easy to find those things. Um, <laughs> yeah, I agree. And, uh, um, you know, l let me just take COVID for a minute. You've got the records of the scientists who figured out what the, the uh, process was. You have the records of the manufacturers of the vaccine, but there were manufacturers of vials, manufacturers of personal protective equipment. Uh, the transportation people, the refrigeration people. To put that together is hard, but on top of it, it is terribly, terribly difficult to figure out where records of uh, businesses like that are. Uh, I have a colleague who's doing a little project and we're trying to figure out where are the records of the biggest oil companies and uh, I've forgotten which other one, but I mean the, the big, big ones. And it's they're hard to find, even with all the skills that a trained professional has, it's hard to find. So, yeah, yeah but no. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hard to find the ones that you want people to see because they're authentic and genuine. But the problem is that when many people do their searches on the internet, they will find lots of stuff. Uh, it may not be the stuff that you think they should be finding, but they will find lots of stuff. <laughs> oh, okay. And I'm curious, so Lonnie and Carla have argued that part of the solution to that is the notion of is, is expertise, authority, reputation. But Patricia, the Mellon Foundation has been trying to help lots and lots of archives that don't have reputations that no one's ever heard of. Mm -hmm. Uh, both collect and, and I assume digitize materials. Mm -hmm. um, so is that a problem? If we tell people, well, you need to trust these institutions that are old and venerable and have established expertise, uh, what room does that leave for small institutions that are new and that nobody's ever heard of? Well, um, and some of these institutions are um, have been around. Still, no one's or very few people have heard of them because um, they have to do with you know um, marginalized or oppressed populations or communities. But I think it's a question of um, understanding where the common ground is between um, small archives and and large institutions. And often, the common ground is um, preserving evidence, preserving um, history. Um, materials that you know tell a fuller um, story um, of this country, um, and so if if there is a way to do that, which I think we're seeing, um, you know, uh, in a lot of places, we're seeing more community engagement from, for example, higher education institutions. Um, then that is a win for obviously both sides. The other thing that I'll mention is ethnic studies has a lot of, I think. Um, potential, more potential than ever, I I feel, because of everything that's happening in terms of, you know, the, um, the issues that various uh, communities have with critical race theory, for example. It's time, I feel, to think about or rethink how, how are we supporting those kinds of programs and how are we supporting the um, primary sources that those programs um, could benefit from the collecting of, of those sources, those primary sources. So um, I think I've deviated a little bit from your from your original question, but uh, but I think what it comes down to is common ground and um, knowing that there again there are shared um, goals and ambitions and objectives, um, and it's a question I think of learning the community, understanding the community, understanding the institution um, as much as possible. Well, and I just have to. Yeah. Speaking of authority, the power, the power, I'm sorry, Carla, because the powers that be who have the authority over our broadcast. Well, I just have, want to oh. end then uh, with saying that the Mellon Grant, one of the largest the Library of Congress has received from a, a foundation, 
is specifically to make that connecting tissue to the local and community organizations. It's not, it's for the reaching out and to making sure that that network exists. Mm -hmm. So you have the larger and making sure that we connect. So I think on the theme, since I've been instructed by the powers that be to finish, uh, we are stop, we are finishing on the concepts of connectivity, learning, uh, which is really a lot of, I think, what we've been talking about and part of the importance when we think about how we collect and decisions that we make. So thank you all very much. And I will turn this thank over you. to the people who control uh, our mode of communication, who, as we know, control everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.